Welcome everyone to the second episode of Fords in Focus, the official podcast of Haverford Athletics. Today, we welcome on men's cross country and track and field head coach Matt Cohen, who is gearing up for his first season as head coach of the men's cross country team. I am your host, Matt Nissenfeld, as we will take a look at Matt Cohen's past and now future as the head coach of Haverford cross country as well as track and field. Matt, welcome on. Thanks for having me. So... Let's talk about before you even became an assistant coach, because you were an assistant coach first, and then you transitioned to head coach. What originally made you want to come to Haverford to run cross country and track when you were a college student, because you're all the way out in California? What intrigued you to come on to Haverford's campus back then? Yeah, I, I, I feel really lucky to have heard of Haverford uh, when I was a high school student in Los Angeles. Um, I was going to be on the East Coast looking at, you know, some good schools, and someone suggested I might find what I was looking for at Haverford. I had a really good tour on a really quiet summer day. I remember the tour guide standing in the library talking about the honor code, what it meant to the students, that students really lived up to it, that they got to take their tests in the library whenever they wanted. Um, on the academic side and on the cultural side, I, I really f- had a great feeling about the, the education and the life of a student here. And then I got to meet Tom Donnelly in his office. He uh, wasn't that worried that I was one of the slowest runners <laughs> that he'd ever coach, at least at that point. Um, I had a really nice run on the nature trail around the perimeter of campus with his son. Um, and I, I got back on the plane to go to Los Angeles, certain that I would be so excited to come here for college. And I was pretty much right. Yeah. And obviously, you know, Tom Donnelly has had such a big impact on you um, on the cross country course and the track and off. So after running for the Fords for four years, what made you want to kind of step into the role of an assistant coach and shadow Tom Donnelly yeah the the four years that I was a student here I learned a ton in school I had great friends on and off the team but the experience with the goats practice every day road tripping out to meets putting on the jersey um, felt like like irreplaceable and and has really guided everything I've done since then Mm-hmm. Um, I was at Bryn Mawr College as an assistant coach for a few years, which was really fun. I learned a ton. I think I got some you know, meaningful mistakes out of the way as a young coach. Um, and I, it was a really great opportunity. It was a little funny to be across, you know, down the road. Right. Uh, you know, trying to get field house access for another team for a couple of years. Um, and so when there was an opportunity to come back to work with Tom one of the assistant coaches that I'd had, Yossi Fritzmauer, was going to be moving uh, with his family to start a new job and there was going to be an opening, I felt like I had to have uh, the chance to work with Haverford students and to get to be at practice with Tom. I could not pass that up. Yeah. Now, I know we're kind of going back and forth, back and forth. Um, Obviously, you did run for Haverford. Um, what was one of your favorite memories as I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here? What was one of your favorite memories as a runner, um, for the Fords? Uh, I mean, this, this might sound, uh, obvious, but it's nothing beats, uh, a cold November day in Waverly, Iowa, um, when we won the national championship for the first time. Only time for now. Um, I, w- I wasn't, you know, in the race, but I was one of maybe two dozen guys who was road tripping out to, out to Iowa from Pennsylvania. Oh wow! Um, we you know, twenty of us sleeping on the floor of an apartment of one of our alums, um, and you know we were there for twenty five minutes to scream our heads off and then get back in the car. And the <laughs> the seeing the results show up was great. Even better was driving back across the country with the trophy in the car. That must have been a very memorable ride. It was awesome. (laughs) Um, 
We only we only got lost once. It was great. <laughs> um, and then and then I also think about like um, senior year. The the expectation every year at that point was to win the conference championship in every season we were in, and we mm-hmm. we failed at that. Um, the first three years I was here, we lost a conference championship somewhere each year. In my senior year in 2012, we had won the conference meet in cross country pretty handily, won it in indoor track, and then really had to have a great team performance outdoors. And it was going to come down to the 5,000 like it always did. Sprinters and jumpers had already jumped and sprinted way above expectations and our Mm -hmm. 5k guys were going to have the chance to bring it home and i just have this strong memory of uh, really sweaty hugs at the finish (laughs) line Um, yeah you know from can't avoid that the guys who were racing but the there was so much emotion uh in in both the success of the performance from the guys who'd been in the race and what it meant to the whole team um that that you know sweaty sweaty hugs at the or sinus track in the early may 2012 is a really strong memory wow that no that that definitely sounds great um i i can't even imagine just a jubilation of just supporting your teammates watching them accomplish their goals to help your team accomplish their goal like just an incredible feeling so you had four great years as a runner under uh, Tom Donnelly, and then, yes. Can I interrupt you? Absolutely. I was a very mediocre performer on very, very good teams. Um, I was very surprised when I got here to find out that I couldn't outwork all of my teammates. I I'd, I'd just sort of assumed that I would be successful by working twice as hard as anyone or running twice as much. Mm-hmm. And... I didn't know. I was so glad to find out that every guy on the team was that person also, right? It's a team then and now, team of you know, guys who are captains of their high school team who really were invested in seeing how great they can be and bringing their teammates along with them. Mm-hmm. So it was a pleasant surprise that I couldn't outwork my teammates because they were also out there every day doing everything they could to get a little better. I feel like competition within the team is great for the over, overall outcome for a season. Within the team, I, I don't even know if More guys just pushing each other to try and do better. I think kind of in spirit with the Haverford classroom experience, mm-hmm. there's a lot of competition against yourself and a lot of cooperation and collaboration with the person next to you. Okay. There's a lot of a big sense that I'm going to be great and I'm going to bring my friends with me. I like that. That's a great message to have. So, to kind of trend, kind of this is a perfect transition into my next question because you're saying you know you're with a bunch of other student athletes that are kind of the same, um, that all had the same mindset, even though they kind of. Um, you saw you weren't able to exactly outwork them. But overall, all of those teams, there was one man that was in charge of those teams, and that was Tom Donnelly. What impact did Tom Donnelly make on your life on and off the cross-country course and track? Yeah, to, um, Tom lives every day with such an example of like integrity and care he only ever thinks and looks for the right way to do things um he doesn't have very much tolerance for the wrong way to do things let's put it that way yeah (laughs) um right if there's a right way to do it and that's the way we're going to do it um and then within that right that's such a high bar to clear Within that, he pours compassion out of himself, right? Any chance he has to lift someone up, bring them with him, to help them set their sights higher, and then see the steps towards achieving those sights, he's, he's just a consummate educator, friend. Um, I think he really believes in the fit 
between athletics, what we do as a team, and mm-hmm. the role of college in educating the individual. And that combines to be such a powerful opportunity to work with our students every day. Um, there's no, no guess about what we're going to do. We're going to go for a run or do the sprint training or do the jump training. We're going to do it thoughtfully, ambitiously, well, and have some fun in the process. Um, and and the, Tom is so good at honing in on the things that really matter, the things that are going to make a difference, and leaving everything else you know to the side. Yeah, that's so. When I first started um, last year, I believe the announcement that Tom was going to retire was literally a week or two before my start date. So when I started working here my first day i kid you not tom was the first person that i met in the hallway and i could just see his and like you know i was going to start work for haverford he was going to be retiring theoretically we'd only be working together for maybe a month or two i'm sure he could you know he would probably care less a a different coach would probably care less right and my first day he was the first coach that i met and he just had such interest in me and wanting to get to know me more, which, again, was a great first impression of the school and Tom. So always very thankful for Tom. And the fact that Tom's even still here just bustling around and helping everybody out how he can, it's a great way um, to see him still here. So moving on, because, again, Tom did retire. Um what and and those are gigantic shoes to fill with Tom Donnelly. Um, what made you want to initially because you were an assistant coach with him? What made you initially want to take that next step into a head coaching role and take over for Tom? For me, it's all about um, the the chance to work with Haverford students. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think about the you know different paths that careers can take and and lives over decades. If I may interject, because you also were working um, a non-athletics job at the time before you came over to Haverford. Yeah, I I had a really good setup. I had this really great, interesting uh, day job at a local school, and then I'd rush out of there every day (laughs) to get to practice. Um, And some days I was more successful, and some days I was, you know, saying hi as the guys were starting their runs. Um, And it was I could have made a whole career out of that. It was great. The chance to come work every day with the students who come to Haverford is feels unbelievable. Um, I feel like you spend so much time at work or thinking about work or, you know, as a part of your career, it's a third of your life, maybe Mm -hmm. in hours of the day, if not more. And to get to come make a difference, hopefully make a difference in the lives of the student athletes here in any way is the coolest thing to get to do that in the context of you know hopefully carrying on the legacy that Tom has started right there's so much pride in what we've done since 1975 yeah right um, so it feels like a pretty immense responsibility um, I feel really fortunate to have the opportunity to kind of lift that banner up as high as I can mm-hmm and to get to do that in the context of what our students are doing, who they are, how they move through the world, and who's attracted to come study at a school like Haverford is the coolest thing in the world. Right. I think the the perfect solution to replace Tom was somebody that ran under Tom and coached with Tom because you totally get the whole Haverford experience. So when you're trying to bring in new recruits and new athletes, You can relate on a first-hand basis, whereas, you know, if another coach came in, they truly wouldn't get the full Haverford experience if they weren't an alumni like yourself. Well, it was, I think the, the hiring process was really interesting. It's really a all hand, like uh, coaches involved, students involved, admissions, a a lot of different voices in the room. Staff that have nothing to do with cross country were involved like myself. Um, and, and so even just the chance to kind of be in the room with all those different cohorts of community members mm-hmm. was itself this great opportunity to 
to learn more about how the Haverford experience reflects through each of those different dimensions. Um, I was really psyched when Danielle called uh, to say that it might be something that I could, you know, get to pick up. Yeah. Um, it's always a little daunting to walk into the room and look at, you know, 40 brilliant, talented student athletes who are so into what they're doing. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's the, you know, kind of our most precious resource as a team is the the commitment that we ask for is so high. We set such a high bar for culture, lifestyle, training, physically, and every other aspect. And to get to work with you know, right now 40, hopefully you know more students in the future uh, who live up to that to the fullest every day is is a pretty immense responsibility. Yeah, and also an opportunity that I cherish. So would you say your first day as head coach, you – so in the intro, I said that this is your first season as head coach for men's cross country. However, you started um, as a head coach of indoor men's track and field back in January. Would you say that first day as head coach was a bit of an easier transition because you saw 40 familiar faces in front of you? Uh, the first – yeah, the first day was pretty smooth, but I think everyone was on their, their best behavior with right. me also, <laughs> right? Um, even though it was you know, pretty much the most familiar face they could imagine. Um, the first moment that felt like an abrupt transition was going to the indoor conference championships mm -hmm. for the first time. It's a, a two-day meet. Uh, this year, it was at Franklin and Marshall out in Lancaster. Mm -hmm. And I was so tightly wound that first day. I, I was useless. I, I didn't help anyone do anything better than they would have done if I hadn't been there. And, and I actually think if you look at the performance of the team, uh, guys were reflecting that tightness back at me. Um, hmm. T Tom says that coaches can have 1% of an impact on an athlete's performance. And halfway through that meet, I was not happy with my impact. I felt like I had, you know, kind of brought the team down just by how my approach. I was feeling pressure to, you know, have a great meet. Well, what does that mean? I didn't do a good job. Day two, I decided I was going to do the exact opposite on purpose. Good. I sat there on the bus and made every bad, dumb joke I could. <laughs> just total dad groaner jokes. <laughs> Uh, Did you do you have one that you can recite off the top of your head? Not enough. No. Top of my head. No. I'm sure they'll come up. They come all. <laughs> they, they come to me too easily. But yeah, not very naturally. Um, and, and and you know my one percent that day, I think you know was to get the guys a little looser. Right, yeah. we'd done all the preparation there was to do. We just needed to get out of our own way and perform the way that we prepared for. Um, and that day was much more successful. Yeah. Um, uh, and so yeah, I felt like I'd gotten my 1% worth. <laughs> Absolutely. So this this could kind of coincide with what you just said, but heading into those first few days as, as head coach for indoor track and field, what were you most nervous about heading into, you know, those first few days and realizing, oh, now I'm the head coach? Or maybe what was your biggest thing you were fearing the most as a head coach? I mean, I, I really, I just wanted to do a good job. <laughs> um, we were definitely stretched a little thin. It took a minute to add some of the coaching staff. Um, right. It the, was a quick, quick kind of transition once you started. I, I felt unbelievably fortunate that Tom was going to stay on as an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. um, turns out pe people retire to do what they like. Yeah. So in addition to seeing the orchestra <laughs> and movies and the Phillies games, Tom has been at practice pretty much every day, um, which is just the most unbelievable thing. I don't think there was one specific thing that I was worried about. I just wanted to be ready for practice every day. Yeah. Um, it's really helpful. We're, we're, we're a year round sport. We've practiced with you know, some fraction of the team every day. You know, from cross country through track. 
So having 415 practice to be ready for every day is a really handy organizing principle. Absolutely. And again, like you just alluded to, it's so, it's so tricky being a track coach, at least in my opinion, and I hope you could correct me. But there's so many different little tiny groups that you need to be in charge of that just do completely different things. Sprinters, long distance, throwers, jumpers. Like it's, it's kind of controlled chaos, honestly. <laughs> yeah. It, ho- hopefully it only looks that way to um, me it looks that way luckily for you as a coach it probably does not yeah, we, we have unbelievably strong assistant coaches um especially in those technical events mm-hmm. uh, with rob upton justice devon started last year um and tom matt katz it's been just this unbelievably strong support network um both working with the athletes in their events. And then for me to have as a sounding board, um, I feel like a lot of my job is to hear the best idea and run with it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to be my idea. I like that um, kind of work as a team with you and your assistants. There's too many moving pieces, too many different sets of expertise for me to expect that my idea is the best. Yeah. It might be, but it's <laughs> it, I, my ears are so wide open every chance they can be. That's great. Um, So I know we talked about you possibly being nervous or worried about something in your first um, days as head coach for indoor track and field. Now let's talk about a little more excitement. You're heading into your first season as head coach for men's cross country. What are you most excited for? for this coming season because your athletes, your runners are going to be coming back in what, only just a few more weeks. So what are you excited for heading into the 2024 season? Uh, the, the, the way we go about our cross country training, we are so methodical, right? It's, it's, you know, sounds, sounds slow, but, but we're deliberate in shaping the trajectory of the season to the point that, even in September, we are just scratching the surface of where we'll be in October and November when the races have a little more meaning. Mm-hmm. So it's this long, slow build all summer, most of the fall, just to get to light fireworks a few times later into October and November. That's an interesting take on that. Um, I like that. And, and, and it's, you know, it's not giving away our strategy. It's on purpose. Um, so I just can't wait to see what that adds up to right at the end of the day when, when we do get to find out just how good we can be Mm -hmm. knowing that we're still realistically two whole months while we're recording this two whole months away from being race ready. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere at practice every day, I can't wait for that first day of practice. I spend maybe a few days at the end of the track season, glad to have a, a breather. Mm-hmm. And then pretty much all of June, July, and August counting down to the first day of practice. Um, it's it's the most positive atmosphere. Guys are psyched to be there. It's typically the best two hours of their day. Uh, maybe they did really well on a test, even then. Um, then they get to celebrate that with their friends. Yeah, they might not yeah. brag, but they'll know. <laughs> um, the, the way we go about practice makes it really easy for guys to look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Most days, they're going to go for a run. They're going to get to chat with their friends. They might be talking about the race coming up. They might be talking about their reading for history. Sometimes they'll probably talk about fantasy football. Fine. <laughs> um, we, we work really hard to set practice up in a way that guys come in with a big smile on their face and go back into the locker room with a big smile on their face. Um, and it says a lot about the culture of the team and the mentality of the guys on the team that they, they embrace that and they can feel the work they're getting done, really good work every day in the context of an environment they're really looking forward to being a part of. Awesome. So you just spoke about culture and Culture is a big thing on the team. Now, as you're heading into, even though you obviously started this work once you were hired in January, looking at recruits, the future of Haverford Cross Country as well as track and field, 
what qualities do you look for in a recruit that's coming to Haverford physically on the track, on the cross country course and uh, off the cross country course and track? The, the, the short version is that, you know, if you're going to be a student athlete at Haverford in any sport, really, um, you're a good athlete, a great student, a better person. Um, academics and character are paramount. Athletic ability for our team, we don't have to. We don't have playing time. We want to see every guy that really loves what they're doing to come be a big part of the team. Um, we've had some of our most successful athletes are guys that they they might think of themselves as walk-ons. They they weren't. Tom wasn't begging them to come to Haverford. If Haverford College is the place that you want to spend four years getting great education, meeting really interesting people, and training, like track and cross country or something that are really important to you, Mm -hmm. we are so excited to get to work with that. Um, I feel like talking to high school students, they, they so often want to know how fast they have to be to make the team. And we just aren't in a position to operate that way. Um, it, it comes back a little bit to like the, the Quaker ethos, right? The Quaker right. thing. Um, and Haverford, you know, you could go through four years of Haverford and, and only vaguely pick up a little bit of the Quaker thing. It actually it touches a lot, touches the honor code. And I think a lot of the way that students are treated like adults are put in position to make some choices for themselves, um, have opportunities laid out to take advantage of. The the underlying Quaker thing, there is, you know, they say that of the divine in everyone, the spark of God in every person. Mm-hmm. Um, from my perspective, we would be missing out on so much not to try to take that spark from every guy who wants to give it to the team. And it's this really incredible opportunity where... No matter how fast someone is, how fast they are when they get here, how great they can be down the road, if a student's going to come make our team better, they're going to live up to the standards that they and their teammates think are really appropriate and high, and they're going to bring their teammates with them, we are psyched about that. That's great. And we've seen a lot of kids that have come in... um, for track and field, for cross country, from their first year as a forward to when they graduate, drastic improvement. Drastic improvement. I have um, a little catalog in my head of, of as a, you know, you know, definitely a walk-on, right? Far from being recruited. Uh, one of the games every year at the start of the fall was which guy in my workout group am I never going to see again? Because cool. they're gonna they're gonna you know start with me today and then get better and better and better, um, and so every year there's you know someone that would start with me and then take off. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about the class a few years behind me. There are guys like Chris Stadler and Avi Bregman who, you know, were perfectly good runners in high school, and you know after by their junior year they were national caliber wow um and they they had no reason to think they should be except that they did they they did think they should be great and then they acted like it um and that mentality right that's a tribute to them it's a tribute to tom donnelly and a tribute to the culture of the program i also think a lot about the the appreciation guys have for their teammates who do set the bar Mm -hmm. um like two two years ago, on the same roster, we had a four oh one miler and a five ten miler. Oh, and when Jamie Moreland got second at nationals, the guys who had traveled out to the meet were at the finish line, ready to dogpile him. Right, it was a joyous celebration. Yeah. When Young broke five for the first time in a mile time trial last year, right? He brought he was the. Uh, a whole, he was kind of the last guy in a slew of guys in a pack to all get under five in the same race for the first time for a lot of them. There's a dog pile joyous at the Oh, wow. Time, right. And so on a team when those two different performances can both be held up and celebrated, 
it tells me that both the performance is going really well, right? That the improvement and achievement is happening, mm-hmm. but it's being done in a really strong, healthy culture. Right. And that environment and culture speaks about the character of the student athlete, as well as the positivity that Tom had set forth to the team Mm -hmm. and something that I know that you're going to be able to carry with in the years to come. So stepping away from the athletic side a little bit, uh, and again, putting you on the spot a little bit here, getting to know Matt Cohen outside of the track and cross country course, being at these track meets, I see so many kids just wait there for a while, listening to music, um, I'm sure really cool pump up songs. Did you have a song when you were um, an athlete here that really got you going before a race? Uh, in high school, I had a, a mix CD. Uh, I don't know if all of our listeners will know what CDs are, but <laughs> I'm, I'm you know, from the Stone Age. Yeah. Um, not really in college. Uh, Tom, it's one of Tom's tenets is that you don't need people to get you pumped up for yourself. Right, Ooh. if you've done the preparation for performance, you know you don't need some. You don't need to get revved up anyway. Um, it makes me think of two different things. Um, one thing that Tom really encourages that you know we'll continue with is sometime before a big race, maybe if not the day before, several days before, he would talk have all the guys just at some point, some quiet time in the evening. Go for a walk and think about it. And just huh. confront success, confront failure. What might it look like? What decisions will you have to make? It's going to hurt. That's what you've signed up for. Um, and just kind of come to terms with that reality mm-hmm. so that on Saturday, on the day of the race, there's no surprise and no mystery. Uh, if, if you need to act pumped up, you might be faking it anyway. Wow. Um, okay. The other That's thing that makes me think of is <laughs> with the guys on our team and the balance they have to strike with their academic workload, there's definitely some skill in seeing what appropriate amount of homework you can get done mm-hmm. in the hours before your race, Ooh. knowing that your brain is going to be a little fuzzy and you're going to be distracted by you know wanting to go see your friends do their performance. Um But there's definitely some skill in chipping away a little bit at some point at at you know whatever your reading is that week i like that try and get as much done out of the way as possible being realistic with how much your brain's actually going to absorb that day correct one of my my (laughs) favorite memories from the indoor season two years ago Mm -hmm. was um we had maybe five different guys were taking this upper level history class Actually, with my one of my favorite old professors, Linda Gerstein, okay, we taking it was Russian literature as history. Oh. So there's just the syllabus is you know five huge Russian lit novels. So they spent the entire indoor season. The five of them camped out at whatever gym we were at, crushing War and Peace as quickly as they could. Wow, which is like a caricature of an elite liberal arts education, but. You know, was there reality for that that semester at least? Um, and, it, and it would always crack me up. They'd be in their you know full sweats, spikes next to them, you know, looking at their watch. <laughs> okay, how long? How much longer can I get away with reading before I really need to switch over into game day mode? Yeah, it was it was a good sight. Wow. Um, finally, the last question. Again, kind of going into that pre race um, mindset. So I feel like a lot of, and I saw this during track meets again, a lot of athletes are waiting around, um, eating something, just trying to get that right nutrition balance and energy. What is your go-to snack when you are a runner before a race, or if you still eat it now <laughs> before you coach a race? When I, when I was in high school, I had a really, uh, well, you're bringing, bringing food from home every day, yeah. right? So you had a little more control. Um, in those days, it was a, the go-to move was a like tortilla wrap with Ooh. Italian dressing, turkey, and cheese. Um, Sounds like what I bring to work every day. <laughs> right, it was like, you know, reliable filling and, and never sat too heavy in my stomach. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
in college, I felt like I could get by pretty fine on whatever was in the dining center that day. Um, when there's, you know, some sort of sandwich, uh, you know, if it was, I think, I think part of the challenge over four years of college, but also just being a runner is negotiating taco Tuesday in the dining <laughs> center, or I don't know if they still have that now, but that was, you know, a, a reliable challenge because it felt like our cross country workouts were always Tuesday afternoons. Oh, and, and you could kind of tell after the third or fourth mile repeat who had made which decision for at lunch that day. <laughs> um, that would have been a big problem for me. Yeah. One thing that I think we really lean on as a team is the, the regular structure that our practice schedule provides. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, because we're a smaller school, we don't have to have class every minute of the day, which leaves an open window for practice in the afternoon. And I think that really helps guys on the team be committed to what we're doing without giving up an inch of their academic ambition. It's really right. important. Um, but I think that also helps having that day-to-day structure around lunch, right? Your body gets used to having, if it's three hours to digest, you know what that feels like. And then you can use the you know practices literally to practice uh, how you prepare going into a race. Um, so like, for instance, this year, uh, going into nationals with Reza, mm-hmm. um, at the end of the year, he was he was the only guy still training for serious competition. So we started fiddling with the practice time to mimic the routine he'd need to have on a race day. Oh, I like that. Right, so, That's a good so idea. The, he, the prelim at NCAAs was going to start at 5.50. So we moved our start time back just a half hour so that he would have to go through the day huh. on an eating schedule, on a sleeping schedule, on a warm-up schedule that his body could get used to so that it would know what it was being asked to do. Wow. Um, we can't always hit that level of specificity um, just with the demands of the school year. Mm-hmm. But when, when we can find opportunities to fiddle and put guys in a position to be a little better prepared for something new or scary or different, um, it seems like a worthwhile move to try to make. Wow. That's a really good idea and a great way of preparing a runner for when their big time comes to kind of just get used to that schedule. So I really like that idea. But that wraps up all the time we have uh, today on the second episode of Fords in Focus. Again, Matt Cohen, thanks for joining me. Um, I think you've had a lot of really great answers and a lot of things that people can think about. So thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am your host, Matt Nissenfeld. Thank you all for listening and have a great rest of your day.